Daniel chapter 9. And we are going to read a big prayer to a big God. Starting at verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princess, princes and our ancestors are covered with shame. Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in all the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, nothing has ever been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. Now, Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an abject of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear our God and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people Bear your name. Let me just pray briefly for Sam. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a big God and that this is a big prayer. And Lord, it will speak to us today. Please be with Sam as he opens up your word, work in us in the power of your spirit. Amen. Thanks, Paddy. Evening, everybody. Um, we are going to be in Daniel chapter 9 tonight, um, but just for a moment, I'd love us to flick back to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6, um, and I guess if you played word association with some of the kids who were in Explorers this morning, and you said Daniel, they would say lions, or lion's den. I'm guessing that's what would happen. He's probably most famous for being thrown into the lion's den, and he is in there because he is faithful to God's commands. He decides to go God's way and not the way of the king and the law, even in the face of death. There's a law passed. He disobeys that law because he chooses to follow God. But what is that law? What is that law? So chapter 6, verse 7, we find out, The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's 
then. The law was that Daniel could not pray to God. He was banned from praying to God, and the punishment would be death. The punishment would be ripped, uh, being ripped limb from limb. So what does he do? Verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the window opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And I think that is really significant for us to see before we get to that prayer in Daniel chapter 9. There's loads to learn from Daniel chapter 6. We could do another sermon on it. We learn about someone being faithful to God in the face of opposition, in the face of persecution. How do you interact with a state that is opposed to God? But what we also see is that Daniel really, really values prayer. Daniel really values prayer. And I don't think it's an accident that Uh, The the thing that this crisis point is over is prayer. Daniel is told, if you pray, you are going to die. If you pray, the consequences are going to be a more horrible, excruciating death than any of us could ever imagine. And yet he prays. He chooses to pray. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without prayer breathing. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. And for some of us here tonight, maybe we've never thought about prayer in that kind of way, because that is a bigger vision of prayer than anything we have ever considered. Because Luther is saying, prayer is not one of the 20 things that you do. Some Christians do this, some Christians do this, some Christians pray. Prayer isn't something that you might do on a Wednesday night, but you don't do on a Tuesday morning, but you might do on a Sunday evening. Prayer is saying that living is a Christian is to pray. Because prayer is the most fundamental marker of faith in God. Because prayer is saying to God, God, I need you. God, I want to know you. I want to know you better, and I can't do anything without you. Prayer is saying that to know God and cry out to God and trust God is life itself if you are a Christian. And so back to Daniel, perhaps the reason why Daniel chooses to disobey that law, knowing that he will face death, is because he believes that prayer and praying is life. Is life. So in a sense, if he chooses to not pray to save his life, he will actually be cutting off his spiritual life. That is a great perspective for us before we get to Daniel's actual prayer in Daniel chapter 9. Is that the way we think about prayer? We're going to uh, see five brief elements of of prayer this uh, this evening. When I say brief, I don't mean, what I mean is we've only got 20, 25 minutes. These are not small things, okay? These are huge, huge things. Uh, Some of the biggest concepts that the human mind could ever dwell on. And here's the first one. Daniel's prayer is prompted by reading God's word. So it starts like this. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, and me by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Uh, Daniel is in Babylon. He's an old man. uh, But he was taken to Babylon when he was a young teenage boy maybe even 10 or 11, maybe even the age of some of the kids here tonight. And he was taken there because he lived in Judah, in Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was attacked. It was taken over by the Babylonians, who were the superpower at the time. And this is around about 600 BC, so about six centuries before Jesus. And they went into Jerusalem, they destroyed Jerusalem, and they took lots of God's people off to Babylon. Jeremiah was a prophet, so he was speaking God's words, And he was speaking God's word about all of these things that were going to happen before they happened in Jerusalem. And perhaps Daniel actually heard him when he was a young boy. He heard Jeremiah speaking. But what we find out is that a few decades later, Jeremiah's words have been written down and Daniel is reading them. He's reading them. And if we go to our Bibles, we can read them because we have Jeremiah's word. And he's probably reading Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Let me read that in a couple of other verses for you. Jeremiah 29, verse 10 says, 
This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me. I will listen to you. That middle sentence is quite a well-known verse, isn't it, in the Bible? I don't know if everyone knows the context of where that falls. But Daniel reads these verses and Daniel thinks, wow, okay, so 70 years after the exile begins, God is going to take his people back to Jerusalem, back to the land promised to Abraham. And he realizes that 70 years is almost up. And so what does he do? He prays to God and he said, God, please fulfill your promise. And that in itself is interesting, isn't it? Because it'd be really easy for Daniel to think, God has promised this, therefore it's going to happen. That's great news. I don't need to do anything. It'd be really easy to do that, wouldn't it? And yet what Daniel actually does is, he turns to God in prayer. And that is because Daniel has understood something that the Bible keeps on telling us about prayer. Daniel's understood it as much as any of us can understand it. Prayer is a mystery, But he has understood that somehow, in God's deep, mysterious wisdom, God has decided to act in response to his people's prayers. Even though he is in control of all things, even though he knows all things, somehow, in his wisdom, he has decided to act in response to our prayers. Maybe that is to cause us to trust him more. Maybe it's to deepen our relationship with him. We're not told But we are told all the way through the Bible that God acts in response to prayer. And so Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, he could say this. I mean, these are a few words, but this is incredible. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Prayer moves the hand that moves the world. Daniel believes that, and so Daniel prays, and he prays that God would fulfill his promise. Uh, This is a this is a really weak illustration. As a preacher, when sometimes you stand up and you think this is a bad illustration. Um, on Friday night, I was at an event at my school, and there was a hog roast, one of the many reasons I love my school. And, um, and when you went in, you got a ticket as a food token, um, and they said to you, you can have um, a f- one free uh, pork roll. Okay, amazing news, great. Um, and you have that ticket. What you do is you then take the ticket to the van that was doing this, and you hand it over, and you've got a pork roll uh, with crackling and apple sauce, really nice. Um, and they gave it to you. Do you see what I've done there? So I've got the ticket, and the ticket promises me this thing. Okay? And that is definitely, definitely going to happen. But I just take it, and I hand it over, and I say, please, can I have it? And they give it. It's a weak illustration, isn't it, of what we do when we pray. We know that God has promised lots and lots of things, but God wants us to go to him and say, Father, almighty king, you've promised these things. Please now would you act to fulfill your promise. That is what Daniel does. And the other interesting thing about what Daniel does is that Daniel does it in response to what he reads in the Bible. And I think when we think about prayer, when we think of our own devotional lives, I think that is a great model for us, that actually we read the scriptures, we hear God speak to us, and in response to that, we pray. I think that's a great pattern, actually, if you are reading the Bible in the morning and and praying, or you're doing it some other time of the day, that you do that, um, you pray that God would open your eyes to it, but then after you read the scriptures, after you hear a talk, things like that, you then respond in prayer. It's one of the reasons why uh, I like these books. We're still selling in the back uh, for a reduced price. uh, Five things to pray because they tell you some things to pray and all of them are rooted in Scripture. I think it's why it's a great thing to have an attitude after the Sunday morning service, after the Sunday evening service, where where you hear the word being uh, read out, you hear it being preached on, to then think, what do I want to pray about? What do I want to pray with others about in response to it? That is what Daniel does. And so, let's get to Daniel's prayer. What are the elements of it? Here's the first thing. He starts with God. He starts with God. Verse 4 says, I pray to the Lord my God and confess, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep 
his commandments. Daniel's prayer starts with acknowledging God. Before he gets to himself, before he gets to his needs, before he even gets to God's promises, he starts with God. And actually, Daniel describes God in two ways. He says, Lord, the great and awesome God. <clears throat> when he says that, he's talking about God as the universal king. He is the one who created everything. He's the one who put the stars in the sky, put the water in the oceans. He's the king of the whole world. But then he shifts focus slightly. And he talks about the God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He zooms into God's status as father and king of his people. Because Daniel knows, and the Bible tells us this, that God is king over the whole world, but not everyone is part of God's people. And so God's people, when they approach God, they have a, a different relationship. They can call God father. The first, um, the first prayer we looked at in this series was the Lord's Prayer. How does Jesus start the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven. We can call God Father. The next bit, hallowed be your name. God, you are great. You are awesome. You are holy. But I can also call you Father. I think the two things are going on there again. And so Daniel starts with God. He recognizes who God is, and he is amazed by God. And remember that Daniel is the world expert on impressive people. Because he has served Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king over um, Babylon, which is the world's superpower. Daniel has seen Belshazzar. And now Daniel has seen Darius. He could go on a quiz show and answer questions about the most impressive people in the world. He's been up close and personal with the people with the most wealth, the most power, the most status. But as we start this prayer, what we realize is Daniel is utterly captivated by God. By who God is. That's the start of his prayer. And then he turns to himself. And what do we know about Daniel? What do we know about Daniel? We know, that, uh, we know quite a lot about Daniel. And I thought this week that actually, um, apart from the Lord Jesus, I think we know probably more about Daniel than any other figure in the Bible, you can tell me if I'm right afterwards, more about any, Daniel than any other figure in the Bible where we don't actually see failings. So we hear lots about Abraham, we hear about Moses, we hear about David, we hear about Peter, but we also see points where they fail. With Daniel, Daniel just lives a really good life. He's just a hero. Daniel is that person at church, he's the older Christian, where you look at them and you just think, wow, they are so godly. They have spiritually made it. And then you speak to someone who's known them for 40 years and they say, yeah, they've always been like this. Yeah, they're just so good. They just do follow God's commands. They live for Jesus in such a godly way. And that, I think, is Daniel. So how does Daniel speak about himself? Verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. Daniel doesn't even get two sentences into his prayer before he puts his hand up and he says, we are sinners. God, you are holy. God, you are perfect. Your commands are wonderful and good and true. And we are wicked. And he includes himself in that. It would be easy for him to point the fingers at others because this prayer is really about the exile and the exile happened when he was only 10 or 11, maybe. It'd be so easy for him to say, God, I know that the king sinned. I know that the priest sinned. My mom and dad sinned. Please forgive them. Please forgive us as a nation. He doesn't say that. What he says is, we have sinned. We have sinned. And Daniel is brutally honest about the sins of God's people. Okay, this is a devastating verdict. If this is a school report... This is really bad. Yeah, you're getting called into the head's office. Verse five, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. Verse six, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Verse seven, we are covered in shame. Verse seven, because of our unfaithfulness to you. Verse eight, 
We and our kings, our princess, princes, our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. Verse 9, we have rebelled against you. Verse 10, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. Verse 11, all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. We're not even halfway through the prayer yet. It is a devastating verdict, and Daniel is hugely conscious of the people's sin, but he includes himself in that. We, we, we have sins. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable, a story of two men. as a Pharisee and a tax collector. And the idea is that the Pharisee is religious. He's the, he's the good guy. And the tax collector, he's bad. And they both pray to God. And Jesus says that the tax collector gets it right in his approach. What the tax collector says is this. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. And let me suggest tonight that there will never be a time in our Christian lives where we don't need to come to God in prayer and confess our sin. We have the Holy Spirit working in us, making us more like Jesus. Um, We should be able to speak with thankfulness about ways that God has changed us, ways that we have grown. But until we get to the new creation, we are sinners. And if we really stop and we think, Okay, think about now, think about the last time I prayed, think about my attitudes, my motivations, my words, my thoughts, things that I've done in secret. All of these things, we are sinners. And so repentance is a continual process. But it's so easy to not think like that. Here's how it works. How it works is we come into this setting, we come into life groups, and we put on a mask. And the mask is, I'm a good person. I'm a righteous person. I'm a solid Christian. And then gradually over time, you believe that the mask is reality. You believe that the mask is who you are. And then you start approaching God like that. And you say, God, I'm good. I'm righteous. I'm a solid Christian. But the thing is, the gospel is not good news unless we are sinners. So what we are doing then is we are taking away the good news. We're missing out on the good news. And we're thinking that it's about my performance and how well I've done at keeping God's commands. And then there's a moment. And the moment is when I realize, gosh, I really am a sinner. And then I think, I can't pray. I can't pray today because God doesn't want to hear from me because I've messed up. So I need to wait maybe a couple of days and be a bit more godly. Then maybe I can approach God. And suddenly the the message of Jesus is not good news. Suddenly, if we think like that, it crushes us. And Daniel knows this. Daniel knows um, he's a great spiritual hero. We're not given particular flaws or or ways in which he sinned. But he did. He was broken. He failed. He was a sinner. And he recognizes who God is. And in light of who God is, he recognizes who he is. And he is honest with God about his sin. But he is able to do that in the context of knowing the wonderful truth that God is merciful. So our next point, that God is merciful. Um, In the middle of all these devastating verdicts, did you spot when Paddy read out, did you spot verse 9, where Daniel suddenly says, the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. Verse 15, now Lord our God who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned. Daniel recognizes that the people have sinned against God, but this is the God who rescued his people from Egypt. This is the God whose very nature it is to step down, to rescue, to draw near, to redeem people from the pit. And then we see how clear Daniel's vision of God is at the end of verse 18. And I think, if you're going to take away one verse from tonight and think, I want to read that verse before I pray, this is the one, I think. Verse 18, we do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Uh, Brothers and sisters, King's Church, what wonderful truth to remember. Okay, Maybe um, tonight we're crying out about the assisted suicide bill. Maybe we meet at the church prayer meeting. We're praying about things that are coming up. 
And that is an, a, a really important thing to do. But we should not slip into thinking that we are doing that and God is going to listen to us because we are righteous. Where we go to God and we say, Father, look at our church. Full of good people. Look at how we're living for Jesus. Look at how we're growing. So please can you answer these prayers. That is not how this works. That is not the gospel. The good news is we approach God as Father because of the righteousness of his son, Jesus. And his righteousness never changes. It's the same Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so we have the confidence to approach. And there's a great verse later in this chapter that I suddenly spotted this week when um, I was really conscious of my own sins. The angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and he tells him, verse 23, you are highly esteemed. But there's another translation of that in the ESV. If you have the ESV, it says, Daniel, you are greatly loved. You're greatly loved. Daniel, God knows all about your sin, but you need to know that you are greatly loved. And for some people here tonight, you need to hear that message. God knows about your sin. God knows about every single thing in your life, but you are greatly loved because you are in Jesus. And here's the last thing we see about Daniel's prayer. He prays for the sake of God's name and reputation. Verse 18, he says, Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. Oh my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Um, in April of this year, there were a lot of news stories about a new music venue. Um, it was on the Etihad campus in Manchester. It was run by the Oak View Group. It would have 20,000 seats. And it was in the news because the opening kept on being pushed back. So it was supposed to open uh, April 23rd with a Peter Kay event, uh, but there was a power supply issue. And then uh, it was supposed to open a week later, and then something fell off the roof, and then they didn't have enough seats. Um, as I was reading about this, I was just thinking of Word Alive. Have you ever had, <laughs> ever had the joy of being at Pontins? It was just like that. Um, and it was in the news, and various bands take that. Some other people uh, moved all their concerts to other places. The manager resigned. And there was a crisis meeting at the co-op, at the executive leadership of the co-op. Now, why on earth were the executive leadership of the co-op so worried about all these news stories? Because they'd invested money in it. But it wasn't just that they had invested money in it. Money in it. If we can go to the next slide, guys, this is why. The reason why is part of the agreement for the investment was that their name would be on that building. And so every news story about this disaster, it used the name Co-op Live, Co-op Live, Co-op Live. And that name was getting dragged through the mud. Daniel cares about God's name. He cares about God's reputation. And even when we just think of God's name, people use God's name all the time. God, I mean, we think we live in like a secularized uh, country. People talk about God and Jesus all the time. But they use it as a swear word. And I wonder if we're so used to that, it just goes straight over our heads. But more broadly than that, do we care about God's honor? <clears throat> do we care about his reputation? Daniel prays that God's name would be lifted up and seen in the most glorious way, that his character would be revealed through the actions he would take. And our church is King's Church Chessington. We are in the King Center. We literally carry the name of King Jesus in this place. What a great thing to pray this week. What a great thing to guide our prayers as a church that his name would be honored. As hundreds and hundreds of people come in here every single week, that his name and his reputation would be honored through what we do, but mostly through the way that God acts. Pray that God would act in a way that would bring honor and glory to his name. So much in this prayer of Daniel. I call this talk Daniel's big prayer to a big God. And really, I think that's what it comes down to. It comes down to the fact that because Daniel knows who God is, 
God's awesome nature, his holiness, his righteousness, his faithfulness, his mercy, his power, his name, his reputation, that shapes his prayer. And as we go from here tonight, let's just think, if we had that picture of God every time we prayed, how would it shape our prayers? If the band would like to come up, I'm going to pray, then we're going to close by singing praise to this awesome God. Father God, we come before you now. Come before you now, like Daniel did, as sinners before a righteous God. But we come before you now in confidence because of the Lord Jesus. We praise you. We worship you. You are a great God, far greater than we could ever comprehend. We thank you so much as we learned in this series over the last few weeks about the amazing gift of prayer that you, the creator of the universe, the king of all things, wants to hear us speak to you, wants to hear us cry out to you. Father, please will we be a praying church. In Jesus' name, amen.